Hello everyone, welcome to my Session 7 teaching memo. Winter has arrived here in Dutchess County. While it was 66 degrees on Saturday, we woke up to 3 to 6 inches of snow on Sunday morning and it was about mid-20 degrees. Dr. Laura and I had three of my grandkids overnight, so my nerves are still a little shaken. But the Patriots calmed them with an easy wind over the 49ers. Uh, housekeeping, we've had a couple of weeks off without a discussion board or a written assignment, but that will change this week. Um, I see that almost all of you have submitted your first draft of your select response test. Uh, it's important that everyone do this, as you will see when I discuss this session's assignment in the um, giving feedback discussion board. Uh, session 7, uh, all of you should have finished the first draft of your SR, of select response test by now. If you haven't, get it done ASAP and upload it on the initial select response uh, test discussion board in your assigned group. I will provide you with feedback that I will insert directly into your draft as a word as word comments in the margins and post it on the select response answers with feedback discussion board. Most of it will be regarding the quality of your learning targets, formatting issues, and the quality of your question types and if they are actually assessing your learning targets or if they are centered on the big ideas of the EdTPA special education. If you plan on doing the EdTPA for certification, it's essential that you delve into the rubrics and understand the difference between a level 2, a level 3, uh, and a level 4 score. Uh, these would make great selective response questions. You will be able to revise your test and up upload it for a new group to take it in a late, later session. Um, see Ch Chapui et al. Um, chapter 5, which is in course materials for session 6 or 7, and maybe both. Um, many of you, the, many of the tests I've seen so far, uh, and I've looked at about 7 or 8 of them, uh, you're not using the guidelines that are in Chapui Chapter 5 on how to write selective response test questions. Uh, and I can tell because of the way, especially if you're, you're uh, filling the blank questions. If, if your blanks aren't all the same length, if they aren't long enough to fit in the answer, and if they're not at or near the end of the sentence, I know you haven't read Chapui at all. Also on page 139, you'll see uh, uh, they talk or write about reasoning questions and reasoning targets. And... I haven't seen any reasoning questions of the tests I've uh, looked at so far. Um, and I've, give, I've, put, I've put one here just to give you an idea of what one would look like using the rubrics. Um, and I'm going to read it. In order to receive a level four on the using feedback to guide further learning rubric, all right, so notice I've given the rubric. I've, I saw one question where they just said on the rubric. I'm thinking there's 15 of them. <laughs> so um, you have to specify what rubric. Um, which of the following would make more, notice I emphasize more, more sense. Now all of these choices um, make sense, uh, but one of them makes more sense. And that's why it's a higher order thinking question. You can't just go into the book and find the answer. Like how, how many videos can you need? How long should the video be? Uh, how do you get permission? Who has to sign off? I mean, th those are okay for knowledge type questions, um, but I've seen some knowledge type questions that are so obvious that um, I'm almost embarrassed. You know, how, how many, you know, which one of these isn't one of the, the three tasks? You can skim, you can skim the table of contents and find the answer to that. I want you to, I'm using this so you'll go deeper into the EdTPA so it'll aid you in passing it, or if you've already had your certification, it will aid you in helping at you as a supervising teacher when you have student teachers. So those of you who are saying, why am I doing this? That's why you're doing it. Um, so um, think about creating reasoning questions. Um, talking about uh, the quiz, the bias quiz, absence of bias quiz, many of you uh, had co commented on the question about empirical versus judgmental methods of determining bias. You can read about this in our text, uh, Popham, 
uh, on page 132 to 135, there are only two ways a test can be biased, by offending someone or unfairly penalizing them based on their subgroup. Notice I'm saying subgroup membership, not group membership, subgroup. Typically, large-scale testing companies use bias review panels to do this. Of course, you can't do that, but you can share it with a colleague. So if you have um, a lot of Latinos in your class, uh, Hispanics, um, and you have a, you know, a teacher, a Hispanic teacher, you can share your test with that person. Say, hey, can you just look at my test to see if um, this offends any Mexican-Americans or any um, Latinos or um, Spanish-speaking students? Um, and in the, the standard that um, bias review panels use is if it might, quote unquote, might offend or fall into one of these two uh, categories. Um, so um, empirical evidence is gathered after the test is done, either given to a, um, a, t a, a pilot test or after the test is given to everybody and you see if there are certain groups that are scoring low um, and then even then it might not those questions might not be biased or the test might not be biased um, as, as, as Popham wrote about disparate impact even this method doesn't necessarily prove the test is biased and that was question number one that many of you got wrong uh, session eight this week's reading and presentation topics are on standardized testing. Uh, the No Child Left Behind Act versus the Every Student Succeeds Act, which was signed into law by President Obama last about a year ago, uh, next month, December 2015. We will also be looking at the National Assessment of Educational Progress, the NAEP, and New York's Annual Professional Performance Review, APPR process. Um, my learning targets can be found in the Session 8 folder. Um, there are many resources that you may connect to in writing your double entry journal this week, which is not due for two weeks. So you have two weeks to do your double entry journal. So there are materials in both Session 8 and Session 9 that you should connect to. And, but you do not, notice I said do not have to connect to all of them, you know, just connect to ones that if you find one that talks about a good method of, of test prep or you find one that, that, talk, that supports your opinion on uh, relieving uh, test anxiety, uh, which you'll find in session nine, um, then use that. But don't, you know, you're, you're, remember, in your annotating the main article, Popham's chapter on test prep, I think it's chapter 14. Um, and you're annotating that. So don't annotate anything else. Annotate chapter 14. Make connections to the other articles. Don't put annotate a few, few paragraphs from Popham's text and then a few paragraphs from something else, a few paragraphs from something else. I don't want that. Um, and I want you to have a conversation with the text. I want to hear your voice. I don't want you to just take notes. Oh, this is what this said. This is what so-and-so said. This is what Dr. Tom said in his presentation. Um, I want you to connect to them. This reminds me of what Dr. Tom said in his presentation. And then you can say what I said, um, and, but use it to support an opinion or to make a connection to yourself as a learner or yourself as a teacher. Uh, I want to hear your voice. Strong opinions, deep connections. Um, uh, you also download and take the groups, take the tests of uh, the uh, members of your group uh, in this session. Try to take them as a closed book exam. After completion, you will upload them to the Selected Response Test Answers with Feedback Discussion Board in your, in your group thread. Um, try to avoid simply praising the test maker. Um, your feedback is important. Remember, I'm going to grade your tests only after you revise them, so you need to help each other out. Um, there is an article on giving feedback uh, in the assignment se session. Um, if I go into uh, coursework by week and I go into session eight, assignments, 
you'll see that there's a, a session there's a seven keys to effective feedback which is an article by Grant Wiggins ASCD article um, that talks to you about the difference between giving advice um, between patting somebody on the back saying nice job um, which I see a lot of <laughs> oh nice job on your test well the formats terrible the matching isn't in two columns um, and there's all kinds of issues with it but you're saying what a wonderful job that's not it's okay to, to say you you did a wonderful job on this section because you know tell them why it was nice um, but then you know make sure your um, feedback is goal referenced tangible and transparent actionable user-friendly timely ongoing consistent progress towards a goal uh, and know the difference between feedback versus advice and feedback versus evaluation and grades good work so give good feedback you can praise but give give feedback that student your your classmates can use um, uh, an important note I'll be using the modified discussion board rubric for each of the next two discussion boards and the test creation process so that if you notice that's just on timeliness and when you make your your initial post um, if you didn't submit your initial test uh, take and get feedback etc you receive a grade of 50 uh, which will be factored into your total selected response test grade so make sure you participate in each of these discussion boards all right that's it for now i will talk to you again in one week uh, have a great thanksgiving and uh, i i look forward to uh, looking at your tests